And good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Hope you're staying safe and healthy out there. Uh, it's our pleasure to be here with you today to talk about eight reasons to modernize legacy information systems. And Sean, before I dive in here today, I thought I would just ask you a simple question, which is, you know, when we talk about information management and, and uh, enterprise content management, when did you deploy your first ECM system? Well, it was uh, right after I graduated from college. Uh, it was the first um, sort of focus I had, and it was pre-2000. Pre-2000. Well, good. We're about the same time frame. I deployed my first imaging system in 1995 for a nonprofit um, before going on to work for, as you know, FileNet and uh, EMC Documentum. Um, so between the two of us, um, I'm, I'm uh, a little ashamed to admit you've got about 50 years of experience with information management and enterprise content management. And hopefully during the course of today, we can share with you a little bit of that experience and more importantly, kind of what we're seeing in the marketplace today. So first and foremost, as we look back over the last 20 plus years of information management, one of the real challenges that we see is the fact that nothing really has changed. And behind this, what we've been looking at is the results of a recent survey that we did uh, in, the, in the United Kingdom, focusing on financial services companies. So here, uh, what we did was reach out to over uh, 3,000 respondents and really query them about how they're using information management inside their organizations today. And we see many of the same challenges that we see over the last 20 years. So one, eight out of 10 organizations indicate that their systems aren't fully integrated with one another. Uh, 52 minutes time to find information inside the organization. That's a number that would be very consistent with 20 years ago. So literally about one eighth of the working day spent looking for information rather than doing actual knowledge work. Uh, and then what we see, and this is very, very common, particularly in financial services, is the number of different systems and solutions that are in place managing all this information. The average number across our respondents was nine. So nine different systems in place. Again, very common 20 years ago, very common today. Now, as we look at the horizon, we look forward, um, and a lot of our customers today are very interested in artificial intelligence and the potential of that technology to help automate mundane tasks, to help them get better insight and intelligence on their business. We see that 60% of our respondents are very interested in this and see the potential of AI to provide that automation, provide that intelligence, but that same percentage, 60% believe their organization lack the skills to capitalize on this new technology. So when we kind of look back at the last 20 years and we examine these survey results, what we really see here is that kind of the old way of managing information, content data isn't really working anymore. Uh, and what we wanted to share with you today is the fact that you know, there are newer technologies and, and a more modern approach to managing information. So these new modern cloud native content services platforms really offer a new approach. And they also offer some distinct advantages that really help organizations in insurance, in financial services to really come up with a compelling reason to modernize their operations. So for the remainder of this morning, Sean and I are going to go through eight different reasons to modernize and talk about some of the innovations and changes that we've seen in the insurance marketplace that are really giving companies pause and really giving them motivation to take a new approach to managing information in their organization. So let's start with intelligence and intelligence making information accessible. When we talk about intelligent information management, a term coined by AIM, what we're really talking about is data plus content. Right? So from a modern content management, modern information management requirement, what we're really looking at is the fact that data is what makes content or unstructured information accessible to an organization. When we look at requirements for information management, and particularly intelligent information management, what we want to do is pair data and content together to make information readily accessible to knowledge workers, to customers, to end users in your organization. So make it easy to find, easy to access, easy to retreat. We also want to start thinking about making that information contextual. When we think about 
performing work, whether that's in the front office or the back office in an organization, the more contextually that we can deliver information, the better we can facilitate work and work processes in your organization. Now, if we talk about modern information management, we have to talk about accessibility, not just from the standpoint of the formats of how we deliver information, but really where and when we deliver information. So it's really about anytime, any place availability. And as we look at the current circumstances in our environment and challenges around business continuity, this is even more important uh, in our present circumstances. So can I deliver information via mobile devices? Can I deliver it via browsers? Can I make back office work accessible in home office environments, for example. And then finally, uh, certainly important in today's uh, day and age, uh, really looking at how, while we're enabling this accessibility, while we're enabling anytime, anywhere availability, making sure that information remains governed and secure. Now, one of the key technologies that we see that is really helping with this information access piece and making unstructured information, more structured and more accessible is artificial intelligence. We thought we'd start our discussion today there. So the promise of AI is very, very simple, really to understand content and data as well as a knowledgeable human, but to be able to do so at scale. And if you go back to those survey results, it's really about helping to automate some of those mundane tasks, you know, whether that's data extraction, whether that's automating certain tasks with content, but at an extreme scale for organizations that are dealing with millions of documents a day, being able to bring some intelligence to that to really make it easier for them to focus in on value add work rather than some of the mundane tasks that are associated with making content more manageable in the organization. From an AI standpoint, some of the key areas of uh, benefit that we see, number one, being able to automatically recognize content types. So can I do forms recognition? Can I do auto classification of content? And once I've done that, can I extract critical data from that content? Absolutely, we can kind of set that up as a separate service where it's of value not just to new information in your organization, but perhaps for enriching existing uh, information in your organization and helping to bring more metadata to content, which again makes it more accessible and certainly more contextual when we deliver it in the organization. When we talk about contextual delivery, one of the things we have started to look at with AI is how you can begin to predictively deliver information. So at certain steps in the work process, we know what information a user needs to perform that task. We present that information to him proactively. Can we begin to look at usage and the importance of information in an organization, not just analyzing content itself, but how users engage with content so that then, again, we can begin to predictively deliver information inside the organization. One of the great things about AI also is it's very good at recognizing patterns and connections between information. Again, this allows us to more contextually surface information, deliver it to end users, knowledge workers, when, where, and how they need it in the organization. The other benefit that we see from an AI perspective is just the ability to identify outlying data points. And particularly in insurance, some of the common use cases we see here really are around fraud identification, uh, intelligent exception management, being able to early on in a process identify an exception, surface it up to provide a superior customer experience and to enable greater straight through processing uh, for different work activities in the organization. Now, when we talk about AI, we usually talk about two different things here. One is kind of generic AI or generic cloud services that you can make use of in your business. These are things like Google Vision, Amazon Comprehend, Textract, Transcribe, other services that are available from public cloud offerings that you can use inside your organization to help enrich content. And I've switched out my usual uh, uh, example here to an automobile accident. I figure this is very contextual from a claims processing standpoint. And what I want to do here is kind of illustrate what generic AI services can bring to the table. We talked about enriching data, enriching content earlier. And what I did was I actually took this photo of an automobile accident. I loaded it into Google Vision's um, API service on their website. They actually have a little trial uh, window and what it does is it returns back labels or data values associated with that image. 
And what I love about this is it shows the power of these tools of AI and machine learning to be able to add text to an image that really has no text in it, other than perhaps uh, the license plate number that sits on the back of that Chevy Tahoe. The challenge with generic AI, though, is you tend to get generic data back. And I've kind of color-coded this on the right. So you can see the items in gray, land vehicle, vehicle car, motor vehicle, tire, bumper, uh, family car, vehicle registration plate, they're data values, but they're not very descriptive or specific data values associated with the image. The items in orange actually aren't accurate. So uh, neither one of these vehicles is a minivan or a minibus, and asphalt and gas um, aren't necessarily very germane to processing this image, perhaps as part of a claims process. But inside of this, there is some good value. So we see that it's correctly identified that there's a sport utility vehicle and a van involved in this accident. It's even identified the model of the sport utility vehicle as a Chevy Tahoe. And it's identified that the accident has taken place in a parking area. So it's a good example of the power of AI in helping to, again, apply data to content to make it more contextual, make it more accessible. The second side of AI that we see, though, and where businesses and our customers are really starting to get value out of artificial intelligence is around business-specific AI. And what this really means is beginning to train your own custom machine learning models to bring more value out of a photo like this. And I've illustrated an example here. So what do I really care about in this image? Well, one, I want to know the makes and models of both of the vehicles involved in the accident. I wanna be able to automatically identify those. I wanna take those values and put them into specific data fields. So rather than just a, a tagging an image, I really want to be able to work with the data that comes out of this image. I might wanna know what vehicle colors there are. And perhaps most importantly, I wanna begin doing some auto recognition over licenses and license numbers. So we have a clear view of the license plate number here. Uh, we can see that it's from the state of Illinois. The second vehicle, we can see a partial on the license plate and also recognize that it is an Illinois license plate. Now, in the background here, and what's interesting is I actually have a picture of a user and I can potentially be able to, depending on what training I've done with my custom model, identify the operator, perhaps map that image back to a driver's license image associated with the accident or with the insured in this circumstance. And what I'm really trying to illustrate here is that these technologies can begin to do things that we've inherently relied upon human operators to do and begin to pull data out of images, out of documents, to really begin to automate work processes and to accelerate traditional claims processes, policy issuance, underwriting, other activities like this that tend to be very document intensive and as you see here with the modern claim beginning to be very image intensive now before i go on to the next topic sean i wanted to take a pause and just ask you what what kind of uh, practical applications are you seeing for insurance companies working with ai today well, I think insurance companies are looking as they pivot to a more of a customer view, and, and we're going to talk about it later Later in some of the topics, is the sheer amount of uh, heterogeneous data that we're seeing. So um, this ability to automate um, the analysis and um, create inferences around uh, heterogeneous data, not just a form, for instance, not just a form that we control because quite honestly if if that's your requirement you can use existing ecm technologies to do that it's about the more unstructured data and you know in this example we see a picture but also social sentiment data if we if we pivot from a claims you know this is more of a claims use case but if you pivot to more of an underwriting use case where you're looking for a whole picture of the customer, maybe maybe you're interrogating uh, an abundance of social data to get you know a sentiment around the customer's um, external reputation. Just that, not that you would base an underwriting decision on that, but maybe that's a data point that you're looking at, and being able to efficiently use that data. Because what's the saying? I have all the data I need. I just don't know how to use it. Um, is key here, and, and AI is providing the key to a lot of that. Fantastic. 
Fantastic. So we've given a good example here of how the nature of content is changing uh, in kind of the modern insurance world. Do you want to talk a little bit more about modern content and how it's more than just documents? Yeah, I kind of alluded to it in, in my last co comment, but it, it it is absolutely more than than just documents and just the sheer amount of structured and unstructured data that we have um, is we haven't reached the 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 top of the mountain in terms of data explosion. Um, so again, I mentioned social sentiment data and at, as you know, the cloud is uh, as as companies, legitimate companies and big companies move to the cloud, that's only increasing the data that we have to deal with in the different structures. Um, so um, again, social is a big one, um, pic picture data, video data, um, lo location data attached to other data types. Uh, we're seeing insurance companies and, and other financial institutions looking to leverage that data. And it's, it's data that's in some ways that they've, they've had for a while, but they didn't know an efficient way to, to process it. Gotcha. So um, outside of traditional Word documents, scanned images, now we're looking at content, whether it's Facebook, Twitter, uh, certainly email content, uh, SMS content, uh, video, audio, a bunch of different file types that perhaps we didn't have to deal with five, ten years ago. Um, I thought it was interesting, Sean, you, you kind of touched on a key topic here, which is uh, the volume of information that we're having to manage. Can you talk a little bit about scale here and, and how these new content types are impacting the kind of scale that customers have to deal with? It's exponential. So, um, you know, we've seen, we in the last, call it 10 years, um, we've seen um, an explosion and that's going to double or triple in the next 10 years. Um, so how, how are we going to handle that when companies are already complaining about the sheer amount of data? Well, the cloud is going to help with that, right? Um, where you have virtually unlimited scale with these big cloud companies. Gotcha. Fantastic. Yeah, we have a uh, large property and casualty insurance customer, and I think you and I talked about this earlier, but uh, they wanted to make sure that their customer service representatives had access to all the same information that their customers did, which meant for them now capturing all of the SMS and email messages they send out to customers. And what we found there is this is an organization that maybe over the last 10, 15 years has captured about 10 billion documents, so actually a very large ECM deployment, but now they're looking at a circumstance where they're going to have to capture about 250 million SMS and me email messages a month, which means they're going to be adding 3 billion documents a year to that repository, which means they'll literally double it within uh, three years after it took them 20 years to get to 10 billion. So completely different scale of challenge. And obviously with that volume of information, you've also got to think about the timeliness of getting that information in the system and making it accessible to those customer service representatives. So when they get that phone call based on that text message, they know exactly what that customer is calling about. Now, yeah, uh, with, with, without AI, you wouldn't. Without AI, you wouldn't be able to leverage that data, right? It would just be too labor intensive to pour through it. Absolutely, absolutely. So, one of the other things, uh, as we look at these new content types, we've also got to look at the tools that users are employing to work with these different types of content. We've also got to look at the fact that, you know. Traditionally, when we originally talked about enterprise content management, part of the, the kind of core argument was, hey, look, here is your one repository to manage all information. And frankly, what we're seeing nowadays is the fact that users are going to kind of self-select the different tools that they want to use to work with these different information types. So whether that's tools like SharePoint, which we see in literally every customer organization, Box, Dropbox, you know, how do we move files around in the organization, get them onto mobile devices, desktops, laptops, you know, whether it's collaborative tools like Slack or like Google Drive, uh, and then even business applications. So in this example, SharePoint, uh, Salesforce in the upper right hand corner, 
where uh, it has its own content repository. And what we're recognizing in kind of this modern content world is the concept of a single repository isn't really a, a, a viable option for most of our customers. The reality is they're going to continue to have silos in their organization. The fact that every day we're getting more and more of these kind of collaborative apps that end users are using to create new content, to collaborate on content, to share content, and the fact that they enjoy the rich user experience associated with these apps means that this problem's only going to uh, multiply and grow over the coming years. So really with a modern content uh, uh, services platform, the goal here is not to get everything into a single repository, but really the goal is to be able to connect to these different silos in the organization and enable users to effectively leverage information regardless of where it sits and where it's stored in the organization. And we think kind of from a modern approach standpoint, got to support user preferences, but the organization still has requirements to be able to better leverage, better access, better deliver this information uh, in the context of work. So it's that balance between supporting these different applications and still enabling people to connect to and access information uh, in a common way across the organization. Now this becomes particularly important when we think about kind of always on anytime access to information. We talked earlier about all the different types of content and the fact that we have to deliver them in a variety of different environments, whether that's on the web, whether that's in desktop applications, whether that's on mobile devices, or whether that's in the context of different applications in the organization, Salesforce, or whether we're working with email coming in on Outlook or Google Mail, or whether we're working with creative elements in Adobe, or we're sharing information using Dropbox. The fact is that we need to be able to enable users to access content anytime, anywhere, and really enable content and information as a larger enterprise service. So what we've really done here is look at, from a modern content perspective, how we change this paradigm. And we'll start at the bottom of the diagram on the left, but we're talking about being able to access information from anywhere. So legacy ECM environments, for example. It's not simply a matter of lifting and shifting information into a common repository, but being able to plug into existing repositories in the organization. Leveraging new cloud technologies, whether that's Amazon S3 or deeper archival storage like Glacier. And even being able to treat different EFSS content collaboration platforms as data and file stores where we can access information from them. Now, one of the common challenges that we see when we begin to access information from across these different environments is that they have different data models. They have different metadata structures. The data associated with the content varies. Therefore, what a modern content services platform needs to do and kind of the new approach is you need to be able to provide kind of a universal data model that sits over these different content stores allows you to begin to normalize data and by normalizing data and again this is a valuable area where ai can contribute we make it easier for people to search across these different stores and intelligently retrieve information or even predictably deliver information out of this environment now of course you have all chris, the services yeah please chris we but we all grew up on the on the you know all the systems we grew up on right they have federation right i can catalog uh different you know uh data from different repositories around the organization and federate out where i'm not having to migrate the content how how is this any different than that yeah yeah, yeah. um it's a good question right we've talked about content federation for a long time i think uh one of the key things sean is that uh is that uh, before it was theoretical, now we actually have the capabilities to deliver on it. So let's talk about some of the key changes here. One, ECM platforms were never designed to plug into other environments. They weren't built that way. And that begins with how you model that metadata. Um, one of the key challenges we see with legacy ECM platforms is that we're using SQL technologies under the covers. SQL is great, but it's inherently inflexible. So as you're plugging in different environments and need to flex your data model, really not designed for that use case. So difficult to get to that universal data model that we just talked about. The other challenge we see is really on the outbound side of the equation. 
right? So we talked about accessing information from these platforms, but we have also got to talk about delivering information to other platforms. And when you think about legacy ECM, what really is the hallmark of those technologies is that over the years, went out, bought a different company and a different uh, solution, plugged it in. These are suites, they're not platforms. They weren't built from the ground up with a common API. So if I want, for example, from a documentum or a file net, if I want records management capability, that's a separate module. It's a separate module with actually a different architecture and a separate API. If I want capture services, same story, separate module, separate architecture, separate API. And over the years, these vendors have done a good job of kind of weaving these platforms together. But then if I want to deliver those services, and we're at the heart of what a content services platform is versus an enterprise content management suite, I want to deliver those services, whether that's to business and productivity apps. So I want to plug into Salesforce. I want to plug into an ERP environment, or I want to deliver uh, content into Slack, for example, or I want to build content in case applications myself, or I want to deliver these things to mobile apps and services. The challenge with ECM is that I have all these different APIs and I don't know where each service lives. And if I want that records management capability, that capture capability, that process management capability, I gotta go buy another module to make that happen. Goal here, and the real benefit of a modern content services platform is I have one common API. All of these services are architected on the same platform. Therefore, it is much more efficient, much easier, much less expensive to integrate and to leverage these services across different applications in my organization. Does that make sense? Pretty good answer, Chris. And, and to me, just as someone that implements these, the biggest thing is the architecture. Because as you said, you know, I think the the ECM, the legacy ECM companies did, did their best to provide what the customers needed. But w what resulted for for the implementer, the clients, is over, uh, the the necessity of over configuration, where I would configure one module, but because it wasn't a one complete stack, I had to go configure the other module. And I used to call it, excuse my friends, configuration hell, where to add a field, you're, you know, to add a field to your capture system that gets saved to the central repository takes out, you know, hours or days versus versus 10 minutes, right? And um, I, so I think the architecture, it's hard to describe because you can't really see it as an end user, but that's the key point there. And I think that's a pretty good segue to talking about out of the box solutions uh, and kind of the role those have played for ECM vendors versus kind of a more modern low code approach. Sean, you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so we we work with with large Fortune 100 companies. We're, we're not working with startups that, you know, sell one product or one service. So, um, it, they're they're out of the box isn't um, for our clients due to regulatory and uh, business complexity. What we find is even if you're not coding, you're doing very heavy configuration. Um, and what we find is if you if you buy point solutions, um, it can almost be more expensive, right? Because you're paying for the software licenses. Um, for that for that IP, but that IP doesn't necessarily meet your business needs 100%. So then you're doing a lot of re-engineering. I think, you know, going forward, we're recommending very horizontal platforms um, such that, you know, if you go back, I won't make them do it, but if you go back to Chris's diagram, um, the bulk of the middle of that diagram was a very horizontal capability that can be applied to many different departments within an insurance or financial services organization, and even beyond, um, even beyond that industry, right? So, um, but you want something that's cloud native, um, has a very holistic architecture regardless of, or, or uniform architecture regardless of service, and then you want to build your, um, you, you know, your business anomalies and your regulatory anomalies into that system in a very easy way. Um, so, you know, uh, I always caution people um, that that are looking. You know, I am a uh, CMO within a marketing 
company and I, um, you know, so I want a marketing only focused platform to do that. What ends up happening is, um, you know, if you don't get a robust enough horizontal platform, you end up reconfiguring what that product does and it ends up being more expensive. Gotcha. And, and Sean, can you talk a little bit about low code? What do we mean by low code? Uh, and, and how does that benefit organizations with a more horizontal platform? Yeah, so low code is, is we, we, you know, for, for easy things, we don't require you to code, but we don't preclude you fr from coding. So the way I describe it is you're not, you're not coding in architecture, right? You're not building a module for scratch, but, but the platforms have the correct hooks for you to build in those, those business specifics. Um, and and th those are the platforms that we like working with and we have success with uh, recommending to our clients. Gotcha. Um, and Sean, I just wanted to hit on the kind of bottom points here because from a vendor perspective, one of the challenges we see with companies that kind of go down the solution path and, and you know, let's be honest, the, the kind of goal of solutions was to try to help customers get better uh, time to value, right, and deploy technologies quicker. And in some cases, uh, with legacy ECM, it was to mask some of the, the, the difficulties in building solutions on top of those environments. But one of the, the byproducts of this is as you build more and more solutions and offer more solutions to the market, you really end up fragmenting your roadmap, right? You're writing, in some cases, hundreds of thousands of lines of code on top of your platform to enable a specific solution. And now you have to dedicate engineering resource to support that solution to continue to, to kind of drive that solution forward, which means that that's a resource that's not being invested in your underlying platform and the capabilities of your underlying platform. And so one of the benefits that we see in kind of taking a low code approach and being more focused on templates and giving our customers tools that allow them to build apps really, really quickly is that that enables us from a roadmap perspective to continue to invest solely in our platform and really to bring new features and new capabilities that provide innovation for all of our customers, not just customers in or in banking or in life sciences or a specific industry around a specific use case. You know, the other thing that we see, Sean, and, and, and particularly for cust customers who are looking to modernize, they've had 15, 20 years working with uh, one or more other ECM technologies. And over that time, a great example, we have a, a new customer, big PNC uh, company. They have uh, 30,000 users working across seven different lines of business with their legacy ECM platform, and they've built over 100 apps over the course of the years. Uh, running on top of that environment. Now, over time, they're gonna need to move those apps across. And this is where we see a challenge in terms of out of the box solutions aren't going to solve that problem. You know, what we really wanna do is take that typical deployment time of months and compress it down to weeks so that they can quickly and easily move that platform uh, across to a new, more modern environment. Yeah, you, you know, when you're investing in a platform, you know, I think a lot of people don't consider the ongoing maintenance costs. And what if you get into a situation where you can't upgrade to new versions, right? That balloons your support costs. It may add risk to your organization because you're, you're out of support. And a lot of the legacy platforms required you to do um, things that weren't, weren't supported. So what you want is a more pure platform where the type of customization and the type of personalization that you need for your clients and for your for your end users is is built into that. The, the platform is built with that in mind. Yeah, good point. So, Sean, I'm recognizing that we are a few minutes into this and probably need to pick up the pace a little bit. Um, but let's talk about a couple other key topics here uh, when we look at kind of modern information management requirements, one of the things that we are beginning to see is new compliance mandates. Uh, that be, kind of began with GDPR for our customers that do business in Europe. Uh, certainly more recently, uh, California Consumer Privacy Act actually enacted in 2018, but went into effect in January of 2020. Um, and some of the things that we see here from a, a kind of com 
compliance standpoint, and particularly for a consumer privacy standpoint, is one, we talked earlier about organizations having on average nine different systems. Uh, imagine that your customer information is spread across those nine different systems and you get a request from a customer, whether it's in California or Europe, and oh, by the way, there are 14 other states in the US that are currently considering similar legislation to CCPA. Um, so if you're not doing business in California, you probably will be faced with similar compliance challenges soon. But you get that request, right? And now I've got to look across nine different systems to be able to uh, represent to a customer what data I actually have about that particular consumer. And then the second piece of this, and this is where things get really interesting, is these consumers, uh, whether it's uh, GDPR or CCPA, have the right to be forgotten. And as you can see from, from kind of the quote here on the right, it came from Deloitte, uh, if companies can't comply with this, there's some pretty serious consequences in terms of up to 4% of a company's worldwide net sales. So we're seeing uh, compliance mandates with teeth. There's some other things underneath here where you know we also want to think about data accessibility and how we you know, perhaps deliver information to vision impaired or audio impaired customers. Uh, as part of a better customer experience. So what we're seeing from a compliance standpoint is, is really a drive to unlock some of this critical customer information. And particularly here, you know, some of those traditional customer communications, whether it's email, whether these are structured communications and for insurance customers, right? Health insurance, EOBs, uh, billings, statements, uh, you know, other routine and, and often driven off of print stream technology communications represent a particular challenge for these organizations. So number one, in order to be able to kind of, uh, you know, respond to these information requests from consumers, you know, the first thing we want to do, which we talked about earlier and I won't spend much time on, is just be able to bridge across these different silos, enable people to quickly search, retrieve information, and be able to to uh, provide uh, information back to the customer about the collective amount of information they have on that particular consumer. But two, some of these information types don't make that easy. And in particular here, I'm talking about things like CMOD, Mobius, which most of our large insurance customers have, where uh, this information sits inside of a large data file. And typically the way we retrieve it is kind of to do an on-demand uh, uh, rendering of a particular document of a statement of an EOB or other information, but it's very, very difficult in that circumstance, one, to kind of do that search, and two, when it comes time to delete that information, it's almost impossible to delete information from within these large kind of customer communication, PDF, uh, not PDF, AFP, uh, or, or Medicode type files that exist inside these organizations. And oh, by the way, they exist in mainframes, uh, the information stored on DASD is expensive. So if you look at the far right of this uh, slide, you know we're talking about opportunities not just to unbind these communications, better comply, but also opportunities to reduce costs, reduce risk. What do we see with customers here? And when we talk about retention and archiving, uh, they have these massive print stream files. They have massive amounts of customer email that they've sent out. They have almost no retention policies associated with this information. So in many cases, they're keeping information they don't need to keep that represents a risk to the organization. And it also represents an incremental cost from the standpoint of storage. Um, so particularly as we look to move a lot of this information to the cloud, which a lot of our customers are asking us to do, you know, one, we want to be able to kind of automate our retention process too, but we also want to think about where we store that information. What cloud tier are we using? Can we use tools like Glacier? Uh, can we use Glacier Deep Archive and can we reduce the cost of keeping information that we're only keeping for compliance purposes? So as we kind of look at these compliance mandates, it's really about bridging these silos, unlocking some of these different information formats, enabling better retention practices, and at the same time, taking costs and risk out of the equation. Sean, do you want to talk a little bit, and touched on cloud there, you want to talk a little bit about cloud and what we're seeing in terms of customers moving from traditional on-premise technologies into the cloud? Yeah, so if you asked me that question five to 10 years ago, it would have been, would have been a quick conversation because everyone was saying they're not going, right? But literally in the last five to 10 years or even you know more recent than that, we've seen all of our customers 
uh, admit, I don't know what the correct word is, that that they are embracing the cloud. Um, they're doing it in, that's where kind of the similarities stop, where everyone's talking about it. But there's a, there's incredibly a, a, a diverse group of strategies among our among our different clients that are actually similar companies on paper. We have um, a major insurer where they have a top of the house cloud strategy where you know they they are challenging their internal application owners, their employees, their managers to say how are you going to get your app to the cloud in two to three years? But they're not being very you know, upper management is not being very prescriptive about how you do that. So they, you know, in-house, they currently have Azure, AWS, um, and other and other cloud technologies. Sometimes the cloud platform they choose is based on the particular vendor software that they're talking about because they want that vendor, they want, uh, you know, one person to hold accountable or one, one vendor to hold accountable there. Um, but suffice to say, it's not one club cloud provider, it's a lot, and it's also not on-premise or off-premise, it's, it's both depending on the data. Um, so platforms, where we're finding the most traction um, in organizations, you know, our target audiences is platforms that can run in, in, you know, have a container strategy, can run on, can, can still our cloud native technologies and can scale to the amount of information that they need to be processing, et cetera, but they can run um, both on-premise and in uh, off-premise clouds as well. Huh. Yeah, interesting point there, um, on-premise, off-premise cloud, and we get terminology confused sometimes. Um, but certainly what we're seeing is that it's not really a discussion anymore about on-premise deploy in my data center versus cloud anymore. It's kind of, you know, is it your cloud or is it our cloud that we deploy this technology in? And if it's your cloud, what's your particular preference? Is it Google? Is it AWS? Is it Azure or some other platform in that environment? Um, can you talk a little bit about some of the requirements you see on hybrid configurations, maybe due to data privacy locality? Well, yeah, this relates back to your GDPR, CCPA discussions where um, you may need different data in different locations or, or NPI data that, um, you, you know, what we're finding is, yes, yes, companies are embracing the cloud, but um, they're not giving the cloud all of their data just yet. Some of, some data is deemed because of regulation or because of data sensitivity, um, you know, the ability for a system to understand data, whether it's on-premise or in the cloud is, is kind of key because it's, they don't wake up one morning and say, hey, we're gonna embrace the cloud and push all of their data there, right? It's an, it's an evolution, it's iterative. Um, and you need systems that, or platforms that can understand about all their data, but uh, you know, hybrid is is key there because it's it's iterative. Good, good. And when we talk about cloud, and we touched on this earlier, um, you know, one of the key benefits we see here is scale and the ability to scale in these environments. And so, rather than spend a lot of time on this example, it's just an illustration of kind of how we see information and content in particular growing over the next five years as compared with the last 20. And as Sean touched on earlier, the order of magnitude is, is, is kind of 3x what we originally saw from a traditional content management standpoint. But when we talk about dealing with those levels of scale and we talk about cloud, and cloud obviously brings some very natural ability to kind of scale up and apply more resource when we need resource, you know, we really talk about not all cloud being created equal here and architecture kind of matters. So when you look at different technologies and kind of modern cloud platforms and modern content services platforms, what you really want to look for is, is companies that understand uh, what cloud native is and what cloud native means. And the thing we like to emphasize here as you scale out these 
different technologies is the fact that you need to be able to scale different services separately. And again, back to that definition of what is a content services platform. It's a platform with a variety of different services. And you want to be able to apply those services separately. So that means individually scalable services, whether that's front end processing, back end processing, you know, your search services, or even your database services as your metadata model continues to grow and scale out the organization. You may as you're ingesting large amounts of content have, and particularly if you're dealing with images and video now, you've got requirements for rendering and, and transcoding that has to happen in that environment. So you wanna be able to scale up your backend services or during peak periods, perhaps open enrollment, for example, where you're getting hit by a lot of customers who are self-servicing and accessing different uh, resources in your environment, you gotta scale up your front-end services. So cloud native really means having individually scalable services. It also means being elastic. So I want to be able to scale up for peak volumes and scale down when I'm not experiencing peak volumes. As I talked about earlier, you want to think about things like multi-tier archive. Does everything have to live in exp expensive, instantly accessible storage? Or be can I begin moving some of my compliance information to less exp expensive, less, less accessible storage in that environment? You know, again, when I need additional compute capacity, can I think about things like serverless uh, scalability? Can I apply uh, kind of instant on compute capacity to help me deal with processor intensive activities? And if I'm dealing with new content types, and one of the things that we don't talk enough about here, but is, you know, if I'm dealing with uh, high resolution photos, video from accidents and things like that, these are large objects. I got to think about how I move them around and how I make them instantly accessible to end users. So edge caching and content delivery networks become very important, particularly for our global customers. The bottom line is, you know, a cloud native architecture really means having an open underlying architecture that really supports your different preferences, your different needs, and your different processing requirements as you scale up in the cloud. And of course, we want an architecture that natively leverages kind of the commodity-based scale out capabilities of cloud infrastructures. So again, as you're looking at modern content platforms, we kind of really like to spend time with customers to think about how do we want to architect them? How do we want them to perform and scale? In particular, as we start to deal with billions and billions of objects as we move forward in kind of this modern information management world. So let's quickly talk about some real customer examples. And I'm gonna move quickly through the first one because it's a bank. Uh, and then I'll get on to the second one, with, which is an insurance customer. But here, uh, what we wanted to share with you, and this is really one of the first customers that we saw that had a requirement around GDPR, that had information locked inside of IBM CMOD, and really was looking to unlock that information so they could comply with regulatory compliance mandates. Okay, so I'm gonna go right to the bottom of this case study and really talk about the fact that one, by moving off of seven legacy platforms, this organization was able to achieve a substantial cost reduction. Two, they were able to, and kind of their first application was a new mobile app for personalized statement delivery. So by unlocking this information, they were able to better service their customers and allow their customers to self-service via mobile devices, key driver that we see from a modernization standpoint. And three, the subject action request. This is where a consumer asks a bank, in this case, top five global bank, uh, to produce information that they have about them as a consumer and potentially to delete that information if so requested. And two things here. One, obviously we've bridged across those seven different siloed environments inside the organization to enable that easy search. But two, we're leveraging process management capabilities to effectively manage these subject access requests, make sure we're responding to consumers in a reasonable time. But the most important thing here was not really about dealing with regulatory compliance. I know that for most insurance companies, most banks, this is just a hazard of doing business. What this organization was really looking to do by modernizing their infrastructure was kind of lay the foundation with this technology for ongoing digital transformation. So they wanted to adopt an agile DevOps mindset and really leverage a platform to deliver multiple content applications that would really allow them to support ongoing digital transformation efforts in the bank. 
that carries over nicely to this insurer. This is a very large property and casualty insurer here in the United States. Uh, they are a FileNet customer. They were looking to move off of their legacy systems. I touched on this earlier, right? Two billion objects, 30,000 users, seven different lines of business, and over 100 existing applications in their environment. So obviously this is a very large modernization pro project moving from a legacy system onto a new system. Now, as Sean kind of poked at earlier, as we talked about, one of the key goals for this organization was really to establish a data abstraction layer uh, through a common content services API. Right? If you're going to move all of these applications across, what you want to do is have this uniform API that allows you to quickly rebuild those apps in a new environment and also to service other business applications, claims processing, policy issuance, underwriting in the organization. So key thing for them in selecting a new platform was this data extraction and abstraction layer they were able to establish utilizing a more modern content services platform. Ultimately for them, you know, the immediate goal was to significantly reduce TCO and to be able to, and we touched on this earlier, modern content means rich media as well as documents. So to be able to embrace new content types with their new content services platform, but the final bullet point here is what I think is most important for this organization, just as with the previous bank. In this case, for the insurance company, their file net system had largely become a file cabinet. It's where uh, documents went to die. And what was important to the organization was that they begin to evolve their service, begin to digitally transform themselves as an insurer and for this particular team who had been working with this information management infrastructure really to become a strategic service a strategic component of future applications and this is what we're really trying to help customers with from a modernization standpoint is not just access to information and plugging together different legacy information environments but really to make information whether that's ai driven information, whether that's uh, existing or new content or new content types inside of the organization, a strategic resource for the organization that they can easily leverage across different applications, whether those are applications built on top of our environment or whether those are other strategic business applications inside the organization. So again, an organization who has kind of completely reinvented themselves by really embracing a more modern approach to managing information. And Sean, I think you're the expert here. So I'm gonna let you wrap up just by talking about how do you get from kind of point A to point B with these technologies? Well, I think, uh, first of all, you've gotta, you've gotta pick platforms that allow you to do an iterative approach. As, as you mentioned, I think the reason, when you mentioned that uh, this particular customer, their file net system had become a filing cabinet where documents uh, go to die, I think that's a direct result of, and and you know we tend to do it right. We we in, throughout our strategic budgeting process, we get money to go build this this platform, but we don't re, we underestimate what it's going to cost for all our organizational apps to consume that content, right? And with legacy ECM systems, that cost is really high, right? So. Uh, we've seen at big organizations that the consumption cost, because they have so many different apps that are interested in this, in the content that we're storing on this new shiny platform, we've seen consumption costs be 10x, right? So you want, in order to modernize, you know, I, I, I'm a traditional guy in the sense that you've got to get your foundation right. You need a horizontal, integratable, flexible system that doesn't require you to lift and shift all your data. And then you need that system to have various consumption access points for all your existing legacy systems and your new applications. And that's going to you know, that's the, gonna decrease your implementation cost because it's gonna be easier to consume that data. That's gonna give you revenue lift because you're gonna be um, able to introduce new capabilities and content to all of your business apps. Um, so it's, it's, just, it's just really key. And it's, it's about, you know, everyone, you know, we, we hammered the, the amount of data, but quite honestly, people budget for, for storing the data. They don't always budget for the consumption. So having the right platform, 
to reduce your consumption costs is key because data is not valuable unless you're using it. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. And uh, Sean, I think we've gone a little bit long, but uh, hopefully we've got time for one or two questions. Thought we'd open it up. 